Hi everyone, this is Ron Vadum with Atlanta Functional Programming and welcome to our first prime time Haskell study group. Um, we had our common list study group on Wednesday um, and we're doing our Haskell study group which is now going to be weekly on Thursdays from 7.30 to 9.30 p.m. It may, you know, end early, it may end late depending upon, you know, the topic that we're discussing. Today we're going to be finishing up our discussion on fold, right fold and left fold, the folding functions that are available as part of the folding, foldable type class that's available in Haskell. Specifically, we're going to be talking about how uh, the fold function, both right fold and left fold, can be dissected when you are talking about building your own fold functions. This later discussion is going to be um, is going to be part of a later discussion when we talk about the foldable type class in general. But that requires a little bit more uh, digging into functors, applicatives, and monads, um, and um, more importantly, when we start talking about complex structures, um, we would uh, have to talk about how to write an instance of the foldable functions for our individual complex structures, and that depends on that's a case by case um, question on how you might want to write your foldable functions for those. But in general, the uh, structure of the foldable function is going to be the same, and that's what we're going to be discussing today. Additionally, we're going to also be talking about um, a little bit more about the evaluation rules between right fold and left fold. This is something that we kind of alluded to last week when we talked about fold left and fold right. but we didn't really dig into some specifics about the um, folding functions themselves. We men I briefly mentioned that um, the left fold is an unconditionally evaluated um, folding function and a right fold um, allows you to um, cut out early. But um, I didn't really um, dig into that in a little bit more um, detail and that's what we're going to be discussing today. Finally, um, our last topic is going to be related to the um, scans themselves. All this is related to the ending of our discussion of uh, Chapter 10 in the Haskell book, uh, as well as um, for folks who are following along and learning the Haskell. This is available in the section on um, data.list, if I remember correctly. Um, folds themselves are at, no, it's actually in chapter six um, on high order functions in learning with Haskell. So let's get started here. Last time we talked about fold right and fold left, and you see um, in our Emacs buffer here a brief you know discussion that we talked about, and we wrote some rules about the differences between fold left and fold right. Um, and we actually expanded and did some evaluation exercises between um, fold left and fold right. And we talked about the associativity rules, which we'll be discussing later in a little bit more detail when we talk about evaluation. But in general, when you are building a right fold or left fold, you have to go back to the original um, function definitions of the right fold and left fold to get um, uh, to have some uh, understanding of it. So if we start out and start writing, you know, with, remember our right fold is this and our left fold is this. Um, if we actually go and look back at our list definitions of those, those are even simpler. The um, right fold is basically, so, sorry, hold up is nothing more than a function that takes in two arguments. Contains this, so a value that represents either the initial argument or the current accumulated value, and we take in a list, we return a function that takes in a list and returns some sort of value of the accumulated value, okay, some, type, some instance of the accumulated value type, okay? Whereas with fold out, we have essentially the same kind of idea but we take the first, the arguments are flipped, if you recall. And we still take this and we get the second one. This small distinction is important because of the fact that um, the uh, right fold, as you recall, 
basically uh, can take in an infinite list and be able to, um, you know, preemptively exit return the function without actually traversing through the whole list, right? So you don't have to complete the whole list to actually get the the um, uh, return value or right fold. And that's mainly because of the fact that it is determined based on the folding function that you are leveraging to get certain optimizations available with you. And we saw that briefly, if you recall, when we talked about const, right? And we'll review const again in a, section, in a second here. Now, one thing to note about um, right fold is um, the fact that, or actually right fold or left fold for that matter, is the fact that um, at the end of the day, um, the folding functions themselves have some have the same kind of similar structure, right? You, uh, when you are writing a fold, right, whether it be a right fold or a left fold, and you're talking about the folding function, you need to first think about what is the initial value, the starting value for the fold is, right? Remember and recall last week I talked about um, the importance of the identity value of the particular type or the function that you are returning from. This is important, especially when you are looking at the types of elements in a list and knowing about the identity um, of, the, of that type. For example, if we are summing the elements in a list, all right, which and summing elements usually implies a numeric value of some sort. We know that uh, from basic, uh, you know, high school algebra that uh, zero is the identity value for sum. Okay. Um, what again to review? What I mean by identity um, value, I mean that for a given x, okay where, and I'm going to be explicit here in, um, uh, in the sense of um, Haskell type classes because um, it can be any type, but really it will, it'll, you'll get type errors if you don't um, understand this. If um, it is a, I think a num type is the parent type for all numeric types in um, Haskell. So where x is some sort of number, right? for a given x where x is some sort of number, x plus zero equals x. That's what I mean by identity for sum, summation, okay? Um, similarly, we have um, for product with the same rule, the identity for product, if we're multiplying values together to get the accumulated product of something, we know that the um, identity value of this, this section is one, all right? Um, and again, you know, following the same kind of logic here, we have the same rule for some for given x for x is some sort of number. Now, instead of x plus zero, it's x times one equals x. Okay, regardless of the operation that you are leveraging, the important thing to note is, is the identity of a given list represents a value such that if you apply, and it's more specifically, let me be more specific about this, it's the identity value for a given type or given operation. And this goes back into some mathematical properties on what, what that means exactly. But essentially what that means is, is the identity value for given type for given operation, where type is a set of values, that identity operated on by that operation for with any other element in the set, including itself, would give the same element back. Right? I know that that sounds like a little... A verbose way of saying what I just said for um, sum or product, but I'm trying to be very precise here because of the fact that identity is a very special value for a given operation for a given uh, for a given set of values, right? 
and it is the basis for a lot of these reductions because of the fact that although you may certainly use any sort of starting initial value for your folds, ideally a fold should work always the same and give you the same results if you give the same starting or initial value and that would represent the identity value for that set. Now, if you use any other value, all right, that just certainly means that you are starting with a new initial value and you're just accumulating from that new initial value. But that doesn't necessarily mean the operation that you're dealing with um, from a correctness standpoint is closed under the identity for that operation for a given type. And that's where you want to be make the distinction because of the fact that for, for certain types, you want to be as correct as you can certainly be and for, uh, for given operations, all right? And this is related to, um, you know, later on when we start talking about type-oriented design and other higher-level concepts in Haskell, this is the basis that upon which you would start leveraging and understanding some of those higher-level concepts, this concept of identity. Um, and it allows you to ultimately compose um, certain types of operations because the identity exists. Um, and uh, like theoretically, there, there are some concepts that we'll be discussing later, like monoid semigroups and um, functors, and, and I think monads, uh, where the identity plays a, a central role. So I know I'm stressing identity right now, but that's only because um, I feel like um, this is a very crucial concept in type-oriented design to make your types more, um, I would say, regular, and you can do some more verification with them if they have this kind of like closeness. I'm not saying all types are uh, will have it. I'm just saying that uh, for those types that are absolutely central to the basis of some applications, it might be necessary to at least know knowingly be aware of their identity. So that way, or at least if, if one does not necessarily exist because it's a complex type composed of other types, you can define one certainly for that. Um, uh, as long as this particular rule of for any given value in, in the set of types available to you, the identity operated on that value will give the same element back. Once we have uh, the identity of the um, operation um, for the fold function, we will start considering the arguments available in the fold function itself. All right. Again, the folding function that we're dealing with, if you recall, takes two arguments here. All right. And um, the first argument is certainly the um, uh, in the right fold case, a element of the actual list that we're operating on. The second argument is going to be either the start value in the first case, when you're first iterating through the list, or it's going to be the currently accumulated value. So each time you iterate, you're gonna pass in the currently accumulated value plus you know whatever remaining items or the next item in the list for as long as the list um, is run. Now, again, for rightfold, since rightfold can preemptively exit um, before traversing through all of the values in a list, um, it may be that once a certain operation um, can provide a termination op terminating factor, it will go ahead and return. The example, again, that I we talked about is const. Um, we've actually talked about const earlier. Uh, when we talk about concept five. Um, and this is important to know when you are dealing with um, uh, certain types of fold and infinite lists that there are certain pruning operations that you can use to actually preempt a, a right fold from completely exhaustively going through every element in the list. And this is what allows a right fold to be um, used on um, infinite lists. So 
One example that I thought was interesting from uh, the uh, Hassel book that I wanted to go over is um, his example of using um, using rightful to create um, to create a concatenation of um, of uh, the first three elements of a couple of words, right? So we have, you know, this list, let's call it, you know, um, the book calls it PAB, but um, this is in, for folks who are following along, this is the, we're covering the example on page um, 368 of the book. Um, we have this example of three specific elements and um, I like this one because I thought this was a pretty neat thing and um, we went through essentially a right fold example of actually building up these things so um, we fold R on let's say the, the structure of the elements and we'll call a fold R will take in um, if you see the signature here It takes in a full a foldable function. Sorry, a foldable T, which is a type T. Um, so that means something that we can fold on, and it takes in um, a, our two argument function. Which in this case, we're just going to go ahead and grab an anonymous function and just return undefined. And then, technically speaking, we can actually work like this and create a function that actually returns on. Import declaration. Oh, right. Let me go ahead and import data that list. Mm -hmm. Did I miss something here? Import top level that all. Oh. Let's see here. Um, oh, not not data dot list data dot foldable. Who does this? see something here. We could try this in the command line if that doesn't work. Um, let's see. So fold R two, three. Okay, so fold R, let's go A B undefined, go through an empty list, and we return A B. KB. Now you can see in this case, obviously, when we try to run, although when we try to run this, the first time we run it, we get a prelude undefined because undefined just means we're hitting bottom. Um, the function actually does execute because all the types match up. Although PAB is a list of strings and we got um, uh, a, a list of T here, technically they all line up. So if we look at PAB, we see that it's a list of lists. Whereas if we do info on T, sorry, not info, I should really use PAB, whereas um, colon T, if we do that on um, the empty list, we'll see that it's actually a, a list of any type. Okay. This is not, you know, strong enough. We're using Haskell. Why not go ahead and just leverage um, some stronger typing? We could certainly do the same thing here if we go in and run this on 
the empty string. And we both know that the re we all know that the empty string, the reason the empty string works is because the empty string is a list of characters, just like the, the empty list is a list of any type. Okay? It's a much more restrictive type than what is available to you. Now, as I said, this example kind of went through and kind of built up to this uh, interesting thing with uh, what a fold, a, a right fold. It, in one way that we can implement some something kind of like what the right fold does for this concatenation example. And um, but to continue on with this, we could certainly you know then take the next three elements for each element that's in the list and grab it and then um, you know concatenate with it but we see that we end up with a problem here okay this is the the function is all type checked and it will work but what we're asking for ultimately is a concatenation of the first three letters of each element in the list okay we're not actually concatenating anything here okay and the reason why we're not concatenating anything here is, is if you look at what how we're actually returning that, the actual operation is ignoring the um, the initial value that's that's available, okay? And more importantly, we're not actually folding because we're not taking the accumulated value of each subsequent iteration and using that to build up to our final result. That's what the essence of um, uh, folding a list is. And in fact, this particular type of fold, we could simply you know, do something like, uh, we, we can, you know, if we're doing this kind of fold right here, we may as well just go ahead and do, use map to actually do this because we could certainly use map in combination with head to actually go and grab um, something from PAB. And we know that this ultimately allows us to do both situations where we have the first element of the list or Sorry, not tail. Um, uh, the last element of the list, if we use last. So this particularly is a useless um, example, but it does illustrate one thing. If you you can certainly create a fold that ignores the initial value that's being passed and accumulate, but then ultimately what you are doing is is you're doing nothing more than a map on each element in the list. Right, and um, ultimately, depending upon the order of operations of the list, you can certainly um, uh, run something else. Um, okay, last map take three PB, as we can see here. So this is not what we want. We want something else. Well, we do have something that we could do in addition to map. Um, which is ultimately something that we could use in fold too, but we're going to pretend map but can't do this. But to show you what it is, and that we you probably may have guessed, is that we could certainly use the concatenation operator to take each element, first three elements of the list, and then concatenate them together. And this will actually go and reduce them ultimately to a fold. But let's say that that doesn't exist. We can use that, you know, just a simple fold right. That, can, that takes the first three of A and concatenates it with B. All right, and um, this ultimately would allow you to um, get what we ultimately wanted, which is oops, sorry. Let me go ahead and grab that again because I forgot to pass in PAB. Mm. Oh, sorry. Once again, I'm messing up today. Okay. We start with the empty list and we go and grab PAB because, again, remember it's fold function, initial value, then final list. And we end up getting what we want with the right fold, which is the first three elements of the list, uh, elements of each word in the list concatenated together. 
Now, if we wanted to mimic the same semantics with fold left, um, we would have to reverse the list. This is the same if you end up doing, like one way of looking at it is if we do concat to reverse to map take three tab, we'll end up getting this. Um, the same idea here is that we can certainly do that um, in um, our fold left by doing um, instead of um, doing a b take three a plus b, we could certainly do b a uh, take three. A plus B, because remember in full left, the the first argument is actually the initial value and not the uh, uh, the list of our arguments. And we pass in essentially PAB, and we end up getting the same exact thing um, if we end up using um, the uh, other list. The difference only in this the right fold and the left fold is how it's actually being evaluated with respect to associativity, all right? Um, the reason why this is important is because, again, um, associativity is going to screw up um, potentially uh, how the, well, two things. One, what the return value may be for a given um, iteration depending upon the operation that you're going to use. Or, more importantly, if you're using an infinite list, uh, you might end up, if you forget that full left, unconditionally it uh, traverses the entire list before it does its function application. You're going to be sitting at the REPL or even wondering why your program never um, stops executing uh, because it's going to be sitting there just waiting until it hits the end of the list. And in the case of infinite list, that may never happen. That's a that's a you know that's the entire point of something being infinite, right? Um, either you run out of the stack or whatever, right? So understanding the associativity of the two folding functions becomes very very important, and you need to understand how evaluation is affected by this associativity. So in the case of right fold, we both know we all know that right fold means that we are going to go from the innermost console. All right, we, we traversed all the way down to the base case, all right, and we work our way out, okay? Now, as long as that base case is available, we can prune the rest of it. We don't necessarily need to actually go and, you know, continue traversing, all right? Um, but the base case is necessary in order for us to do the innermost part of the evaluation all the way out, okay? In the case of um, fold of left fold, and this is one way I think about it, left fold base case is basically, are we at the end of the list? Right fold, that may not necessarily be the trick case, right? So right fold, it may be that we might need something else, but left fold certainly requires us to be um, um, that way. And we can see this when we look at an example. We've actually encountered quite a few examples when we start talking about, um, you know, uh, uh, lists here, but I'm just going to briefly mention, um, let's say that we create a partially applied function. This is another example from um, the uh, page 372 that I thought was pretty neat to, to cover and review. Um, let's take the example, that, uh, so reviewing example in page 372, we have the example of um, a partially applied function that basically takes the cons operator on the empty list, right? So this guy here is nothing more than, whoops, did I forget something here? Mm. Oh, okay. RCF, let me see this, is taking some duration and returning a B. All right. 
because we are doing nothing more than we Okay, so the problem is it's the function signature. Um, let's go ahead and try this in our REPL and see what happens. What is the type of RCF? Ah, okay, so what I have to do is say RCF takes in a foldable object and creates, a T has the input of foldable A, and then returns a list of A. Okay, so we're now good. So we have now our type of RCF being the same, so we are actually good. Now, let's say furthermore we have some X's here. In this case, we have kind of this list that has a great favorite bottom value, undefined, defined, okay? And um, we are not worrying about, for the time being, the type signature for this guy, all right? Um, if we just simply, again, call a take on this, we know that we can actually get from RCF of X's, we can actually get um, another list. And again, recall this because of the fact that um, right fold doesn't necessarily evaluate the undefined if it doesn't need to, okay? So in this case, we've caused undefined into the list, all right, when we did um, uh, RCF. So the first time, remember, we we, we evaluated this. Um, we basically go through and we start when we do RCF of X's. Remember, we are basically starting with the um, the one colon RCF of X's. Okay. Oh, oh sorry. Rest. Sorry, not rest. Tail <laughs> of X's, um, which then you know begat to do colon two, then eventually colon three, and then eventually undefined, and we hit the base case, and then work our way up. Now, although we hit this undefined here, notice we're collecting these, but we're not necessarily leveraging them okay so yes at the end of this evaluation technically you have one two three undefined but again this cons operator structure does not evaluate the value in the node of the con cell until it is called upon okay so re remember when we talked about spinal evaluation all right this con cell it creates the spine that until it hits this cell Whatever is actually in the cell doesn't get evaluated. As a result, we don't necessarily have to worry about this, but let's say that we created a, a different function, foldL, that operates on this, okay? Um, and again, we're gonna have to use the same foldable Structure. Ignore the. I know this. We, we haven't really dug into the foldable type class, but for the time being, just know that foldable. We like I mentioned last time contains fold R and fold L. Okay, left fold, right fold. It also has a bunch of other functions. If we operate this on this guy, if I call this guy on um, X's, you're going to end up getting a prelude and um, uh, evalu uh, evaluation error. I'm not gonna try loading it because we'll end up getting an error, of course, when you try to do this. But um, you may certainly see, um, one second. Uh, no, that's not what it is. Um, I think this, oh, right, 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 right. 
B, I'm oh, sorry, B, D, whole left is Okay, so LCF equals L on the concatenation operator, and our initial value is going to be this, and it should not throw any error. Cannot construct anything. Oh, okay. We can't actually create that because of the fact that there's no type in this um, in this list. So. I forget. So, when you look at the functionals, the function signature, I misread this function signature. So, when you, since left fold requires the initial value, okay, type up front, you can't create a partially applied function of this on the empty list because it has no idea of, you know, what the type is, all right? Now, if you, for example, type this to say, list of integer, all right, if you did this, I think this may work, or even int for that matter, just because, nope, that did not work, we can't even do that. Actually, let me see. Maybe I have to go and put it in parentheses. No, you can't. Because it needs to actually know about the initial value. So that goes back to what, um, what I was saying before. Left fold requires a lot more information in order for it to actually work. So how can we actually leverage this to create a partial really applied um, function that works similar in semantics to, to right fold? Excuse me for a minute. One way we could certainly um, do this is is by doing a flip on it. Remember, flip basically um, is a function that flips the arguments on the function and returns the same value. So we can certainly use flip to create this left fold. But what does that do? Well, this now needs you to actually create a type signature if you want to put it in fold, and this is now the same signature as this guy, as you can clearly tell from our REPL. So now everything is working. And now if we call, um, you know, what we had earlier, take three to LCF of X's, you might expect that this is going to ultimately give us the same results as we had before. But no, that's not what's going to happen. What's going to happen is, is since flip flips the arguments, we've reversed the list. We've talked about this last time. So what's going to end up occurring is that the first argument all right, of this list, and we've talked about this last time here. I'm just trying to pull up what we did before. Um, Ah, this is fold R, this is fold L, this one. This is essentially what we're doing, right? We talked about this um, last time. And so ultimately this evaluation then is going to be giving us the reverse of this list. So undefined is going to be the first element of this list, not one. Which means if we try executing this, of course, as expected, we're going to get the undefined exception, right? That's important to know when you are um, trying to take um, a potentially infinite list or a list that contains a bottom value and trying to operate on it using a left fold versus a right fold. If you try to change the arguments in some shape or form, you're going to end up getting getting potentially burned for it.
Great. Um, we've also seen this kind of preemptive stuff of, with the right fold when we dealt with cons. Recall last time we did this kind of example where we had not folder, folder, fold our const initial value 0 to 5. Okay, and we saw that we, we ended up getting 1. The reason why, remember, when we got, we got 1 was because um, const itself, the types of your drug const, takes A and B and returns an A. And remember that in the first evaluation of the above operation, fold R const 0, that equals um, const 1 fold r 0, 2 through 5. Okay? 0 is not actually evaluated just yet. And because const, sorry, we don't need a const operator there. Because const, um, and let's do a dollar sign here. This is kind of equivalent for folks who are used to seeing parentheses, const1, open paren, fold r, 0, 2 through 5. Okay? Both of those are equivalent. Um, but because we're using const, that second value, as you saw with the type signature, is, can be completely ignored. It can be proved. All right? And that's the important thing to note about um, a right fold. Because we have this ability to uh, prevent potential evaluation, all right, or if you end up uh, pretend, uh, want to, you want to end up using um, a right fold. If you use a left fold, you're going to probably have to flip um, uh, the cons and equal, but by doing so, it may end up um, giving you um, results that don't necessarily match um, fold R. The reason I say don't necessarily match is because of the fact that it depends on the operation, whether or not it's commutative, and we talk about the commutativity of some stuff. This in, in, important distinction um, means that for finite lists, all right, for lists of a particular size, And this is a very important and very interesting thing that we see on um, 373. There's a nice, interesting relationship that I want us to work through. A fold R on a function, given some initial value in a list of elements, is essentially a fold left, a left fold, on that function flipped with its arguments flipped with the same arguments and the same initial function. Sorry, and the re reverse of the original arguments. Okay, this is a very, very important thing to note. Let's see an example of this. Okay, um, let's take, for example, uh, our good friend one through five. All right, we have one through three, four, five. We know that if we fold R on the concatenation operator with this X's, we're going to get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But if we just do this blindly, we know that we're not necessarily going to get um, the same results. But this, we're going to actually get the reverse of the results, right? No, sorry. Um, we're going to actually get the... Um, the error because of the fact that again an empty list we can't use an empty list with dealing with um, this types but if we end up doing what we did before and we flip it and we start with the null operator sorry not the null the empty list we'll end up getting the reverse of this list why is that again the reason this works is because the first time you actually run the execution, it is actually empty list, initial colon empty list, all right? Remember, 
although we don't show it here in the syntax, the last element of this list is the empty list, okay? The last element of this list is the empty list. When you actually exit, it will hit the base case, which is the empty list, right? It is nil, all right, if, if you're coming from the list land, all right? It's not necessarily an element, but it's a special value to, to denote that you actually hit the empty list, all right? So how do we match up what we had earlier to kind of prove what our, our, our premise here? Well, if we, let's go ahead and do this to match our scenes. If we just simply do flip, this alone we saw earlier doesn't work. But if we reverse our elements, we'll see that we'll end up getting the same exact result. So for finite lists, this and the left fold with the function flipped on the reverse, operating on the reverse list, are going to be exactly equivalent. All right, they're going to give you the exact same operations. That's uh, a very uh, important result that we just saw. We can also see the same thing if we end up doing the following, okay? Instead of doing reverse on the list here, if we just simply do reverse composed with the fold out of the flip operation, okay, on the empty list of x's, we'll see the same results. And again, that makes sense because what do we have? What is this evaluation going to do? It's going to create that, which ultimately allows you pass that result to reverse and re reverses it, all right? So the bottom no line, the bottom notion, the evaluation order that you should, you should recognize is one, when you're dealing with right fold, the folding function, all right, takes in the rest of the fold as an argument, right? It doesn't actually uh, do uh, what fold L does, which is a tail call, all right? It doesn't necessarily create a, a, a tail call like left fold, all right? Um, that's something interesting to note. I was, I was when I read this, um, I thought it was, uh, uh, it meant that um, fold R doesn't do um, tail call optimization or do any sort of tail calls, but it's, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that. It just means that the um, right fold is conditional upon whether the folding function F asks for more of the results after it folded the list or whether or not it needs to terminate, all right? That is an important thing, all right? The rest of the fold is actually what that accumulated value is, right? That accumulated value is always going to be passed on until we hit some sort of condition that determines, okay, we don't need the rest of the fold go ahead and run the function evaluation. Okay, the function application. And then build it up, evaluate the function, return the value, right? With fold, this allows, this particular thing about conditionally determining whether or not we need to continue to traverse and call the next uh, element, allows us to actually go and traverse infinite structures, infinite lists, okay? Um, and when you're, when we talk about foldable as a type class and we're writing our own, like, foldable instances that implement these um, functions, that's something that you need to recognize and make sure you account for when you're building your own uh, instances of the foldable type class on your types, okay? Goes back to our type design discussion that we were talking about earlier. Left fold basically does your traditional tail call recursion of the list, which potentially will obviously, well, not potentially, it will blow up on infinite lists, all right? So 
just don't use it with infinite lists. If you know you're going to be dealing with infinite lists, whether it's a filtered infinite or a remove, if you're not taking anything, it is uh, on the, uh, out of that list, some finite subset of that list, just don't use left fold. Use right fold, right? You can certainly do some interesting operations if you need that and to, to operate on some subset of an infinite use list to act like left fold in right fold, um, but you don't, you just cannot use left fold as is. You cannot use vanilla left fold. Okay. Are there questions on this? Yes. Let's see, those of you watching the stream, just feel free to post a question, and um, I will, you know, answer them in due time. So let's quickly talk about scans. We actually touched on scans last week. Um, we saw our good old right scan and our good old left scan, just like right, right and left fold. You have these scanning operations. And recall that these scanning operations basically, um, like map, they return a list of results. But what their results are is like a fold and they are accumulating the results. Um, but they keep each accumulated value of the previous element as an intermediate value and then use that in the final result list, okay? Remember when we use this to actually do scan R on plus from zero from one to five, okay? We ended up getting, you know, this uh, result where we started with zero, we added five to it, then we added four, which gave us nine, we added three, which gave us 12, added two, which gave us 14, and finally, at the top of the list, we have our final value, which is 15, which differs if you use scan L, which will certainly use, oops, sorry. Let just notice something here. Scan L, if we just use this, we end up getting the opposite one because remember our evaluation rules, we get zero plus one, then that result goes to plus two, then that result goes to plus three and so forth. All right, um, that is why you end up getting these different set of intermediate results. Ultimately though, because addition is a commutative operation, 15 is always going to be the final value. It's just that 15 is going to either be at the beginning of the list if you're dealing with scan R, or at the end of the list if you're using scan L. All right. Um, this is much like right fold and left fold, but because, again, they don't, they don't, they return lists, not, they don't actually return the final values, okay? But this also means something important, okay? Remember when we talked about at the beginning of the chapter, um, this notion of um, catamorphisms last time, all right? And I mentioned that catamorphisms is the process of how you break down something and you return something, okay? In this case, according to that definition of what a catamorphism is, technically speaking, scans and maps are, for that matter, not catamorphisms, okay? They don't destructure the data and deconstruct the data and give you some sort of result as part of that destructuring, right? It's not a single element. It is actually potentially a collection of elements. Um, but there's a side effect to this from a categorical perspective, which is um, scans aren't actually folds. Scans Although a scan has has an element of its final result, the final value of what ultimately is a fold, it is not a fold in, in, in that regard. It is actually um, a, um, you can think of it as a simple traversal and basic evaluation. Um, but it is, and the way it's implemented can certainly be similar to what a fold does. But Again, since you're doing essentially an, an, an intermediate evaluation of the accumulated value plus the current value that you're traversing on the list, appended to the current set of intermediate results that you've computed, it is not technically from a definitional, uh, 
den denotational standpoint a um, an actual fold itself, right? Um, and we've seen multiple examples of folds. Um, we and we've we've talked about kind of like what um, a fold does, but very quickly in this example, if we use let's say this on the first three integers instead to make simplify the logic a little bit, um, the ultimate list will be zero, zero plus one, zero. 0 plus 1 plus 2, 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3, all right? So this is kind of how it structures. The first call in the case of scanl is just the initial value. So boom, we end up creating a new list and we append, um, sorry, we prepend um, 0 to that list. Uh, next up, what we do is, is we end up uh, appending the um, zero plus one uh, uh, element into into that list, all right? After computing it, okay? The next the next call, we end up adding two to that result and add that to the list. And then finally, we go ahead and evaluate the, the final list that we, we which, which will give us six. And this is how uh, ultimately all of the um, functions are created, okay? In this case, what you saw here Okay, if we go back and, you know, remember the precedence of this is ultimately, let's see if, yeah, it doesn't work here. Let's see if this, the precedence of this, and I'm just going to show one example of this, is, yeah. this oops yeah. it gets evaluated like this right remember we are always appending the single results and this is what the left fold is is ultimately doing we see this in the same case here if we do this this is ultimately what, what we're computing okay So how does this kind of work, all right? And, well, we need to look at um, kind of how ScanL is um, implemented. Now, remember, um, older versions of GHC and, um, and Haskell kind of implemented both left and right scans uh, slightly differently than what they are in later versions. Specifically, GHC evolved the definitional definition of scan left scan to leverage pattern matching a lot more explicitly in it than in earlier ones where it uses the case of syntax to actually determine the patterns. Okay, this is very much in line with how a lot of ML variants implement um, different pattern matching um, in their respective um, languages, and I'm including in this list um, OCaml. F sharp, uh, I think Reason also does this. Although Reason, for folks who um, use it, uh, I would argue that Reason is nothing more than an extension on top of OCaml. Others may consider it a different language entirely because it has a command line thing that transpiles to JavaScript. But that's a matter of discussion, um, <laughs> honestly. Uh, At the end of the day, though, this syntax is, um, makes it pretty clear um, uh, as to what we are uh, doing, all right? So we can use this syntax and create a version of scan, example of left scan for illustration purposes using the same syntax from older versions of GHC. And this is kind of what was covered um, in um, page 376 of, uh, of um, the Haskell book. And I think this is a particularly interesting thing to discuss. We have essentially a scan 
mind scan L, which basically takes again. Remember, scan L takes an element. Sorry, a two argument function. Let's do. Yeah, it doesn't matter. These are all type variables and returns a. We're going to create a has in the our initial value, then we take a, a list of b and we return a list of a. Okay. You may you know you may attempt to implement this using you know say um, something else like pattern matching, and we could implement both to kind of illustrate the differences. But for the time being, I'm just going to say we have scan l a function f, initial value q, and our x's. And then we cons the first value q, all right? And we associate that with case x's of, okay? If we get the empty list from x, we return the empty list. Otherwise, if we get x colon x's, what we do is, is we just run scan l, all right? On f, given our accumulated value associated with x and x's, all right? So this here is just saying that we have um, our accumulated value thus far, all right? So the first time it is and make this more explicit, let's say this is our accumulator, CC, CC, okay. So, when we define this, oh, right, let me go ahead and for the time being, comment this guy out, okay. Now, everything should be golden. Um, Ah, I see what the problem is. Our list, let's call this LST. LST. Now we're all golden. Okay, so no more name shadowing. Right? Um, if you look at this, this becomes pretty clear. What we're doing is we have our accumulator. We're appending the rest of the list on top of it. If it gets, ends up getting the empty list, we end up traversing through the list, scan it, constructing the list is all there. So we end up returning the normal list or not. But how, how does this, um, how can this be used? Well, well, we've seen um, people write, you know, like say the Fibonacci numbers, all right? Um, and this is something that I think the, um, the book covers um, quite well. And um, this is similar to what I think Learning at Haskell also covers in chapter six on um, folds and courses. Um, but the idea is, is basically uh, nothing more than, uh, we can operate and use the structure to ultimately create a example of um, a uh, of a infinite list, right? That we can operate on. Okay, and we can use this to actually grab, you know, certain numbers off of it. Okay, so let's take one example of this, right? Um, let's do, what should I use? Got it. All right. We can use this to create the following. Let's say that we have, you know, something called squares, right? And we use this to create, let's say we map x 
x x on the list of squares. All right, so we now have an infinite list. Okay, that we just loaded. Obviously, we can't actually leverage that, but we want to be able to grab, let's say, different elements in this. We want to index into this whenever we want to. Well, one of the nice things in Haskell is this nice little operator called the bang bang operator. Hmm. I was under the impression that it was there. Oh, sorry. I have to put parentheses on it. The bang bang operator. Okay, it's an index operator. And what this does is a two argument function. It takes in a list, could be potentially infinite, um, and an integer, and will return you a value. The nice thing about this is, is now we could deter, we could, instead of actually calling this squares function and this infinite list, we could provide an accessor now to any element in that list. infinite list and it'll only generate those elements when we need it all right this is pretty, this is pretty useful right um you can also use for example um the left scan to actually generate uh you know a um a quick summation function, a quick indexed function for that I'll have the sum of the elements up to a certain point. Mm, actually, take that back. Let me let me let me let me think about this for a second. What would be another example of this? Actually, I think maybe the uh, yeah. Let's take the example that was provided. Let's do. I mean, we could certainly do this, but we could also use, um, let's do, let's write this in terms of scan. We'll do one colon recursive scan out implementation of a infinite list of squares, All right? To do this, um... No, this won't work. Let's do do something else. Ah, easy. We we'll just add. Let's we'll start with zero, and we add infinite list of numbers. Because I'm just illustrating kind of what the um without having to get get started on um. The final example that I want to cover too. Um, scan L plus, right? Um, two on evens because this itself is a is a list, right? So this is something that you can just uh, just be aware of. Evens is a list of integers. It's an infinite list of. Okay. So now let's say that we want you know an accessor for this. We could say evens at. All right, and we call this with this index. And what this is ultimately is going to be evens has to this index. All right, so this evens at takes in a list of integers and an int, and it returns an integer, All right? Mm. What did I miss? Uh, into Match. Oh, sorry. We don't need that. Now I'm thinking for it. Then this cannot do this. 
because it's probably doing a small int, not a big int. So we need that. And click up. Oh, there we go. All good. This is kind of some stuff that you would get used to when you're when you're looking at the type signatures and you have to correct them as you had to go along to get things kind of aligned up. So if we look at even that, we see that there's an integer to the thing. So let's start with something simple. Let's say that we want to get the tenth even number. Hmm. Evens at zero. Evens at oh right. Because of the fact that what we're doing is is we're actually uh uh, uh, accumulating the summation of up, up, up to a, a certain thing. Evens at 6 is going to be 16 because of the fact that we're adding um, 2 to every 1. Alright, we started 2, then 2 plus 2 is 4. And, we'll, and we can actually see if we do take 5 evens we'll see that we end up getting a scan L on all the even numbers here, right? We're not actually applying this. We could change this a little bit up uh, just so that it will always take the previous value and then um, return uh, um, the accumulated value um, correctly. But um, the reason why this is 0, 0, 2, 4, 6 is because of the fact that um, we're just, uh, we do a take six, let me just make sure. Take six evens. We end up getting zero, two, four. Yeah, because six plus four is, is 10. The accumulator is gonna be um, 10 at this point. So one way to actually go and functionally get this correctly Let's do a better one. Pot. I'm going to do this. Power of 2. I think this might be a better way of doing this. On. The first case is 1 times 2. 2 times 2 is 4. Let's see this. Mm -hmm. Alright. Let's do this. The computation is but let's see. Um, well, it's not bad, but let's take three. Right, let's see this. One, two, two. One times two is right. These are all intermediate results. And then the final element that we're going to get is going to be um, the uh, is going to always be added. So the first time we scanned it, we get a one, and then we get a one times two, and then ultimately. The third time, we get uh, a two. Wait a second. Eight times two. Do that one more time. The first time is the empty. The second time is going to be first time is going to be okay. the second time is going to be two is four. Hold on. Now I have to go and look at the scan L one more time. Scan L plus zero one two five again. This is the we do we got one, two, three, four, five, so zero, zero plus one is one. 3 plus 1 plus 2 is 3, 3 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 is 6, and so forth. 
So here we have to create. Oh, right. We need to first create the three elements and then we can then do the scan on them. So here we do, we're doing the first time we do scan L on, on this integer to create this is pot is powers of two example, which is incorrect. We're going to grab, uh, In the initial value, it's going to be one. All right. So let me just do this. Take three. Okay. First time we have this, it's going to be um. the empty list colon with the one. Right. The second time we call it, this is going to be one, two. All right. The third time we call it, it's going to be one again with two again. And with another two. So when you call it four times, you're going to have to do, you see there are four elements. The first time it's going to be the empty. Second time it's going to be the list of one. The third time it's going to be the list of one, two. And then the fourth time it's going to be the list of one, two. And then the intermediate results that we got before, which is going to be the scan of whatever. So, so the first time it's going to be just empty colon empty one okay and then one is going to go past into scan and then we're going to end up getting scan two one and uh two which will give us one two two because remember left to right is uh, associativity it's going to uh, mean that we're not going to actually hit the base case until we completely traverse through the list so So and this is why, this is why when we do two pot, we get one because that's the empty list and then one, two, which gives us two. So that's why that's wrong. So let me, let me just go with this other example. This, is a, this example is, to illustrate this, you can also use uh, what uh, the book uh, refers to has the or simple way to implement Fibonacci page. I was just trying to come up with a different example here, but I think it's probably just referencing this would be good enough to kind of illustrate at home. And what this does is it goes and say let's change this and oh well we don't need to change this we'll change this to fibs and and this is just nothing more than a list that takes a scan of plus one fibs and as we saw earlier the first time you run this you're going to hit the, the empty list the second time you're going to hit the first element and then the third time you're going to hit the first and the second element which is one one and that's what you're going to be leveraging with this recursive nature to come up with the Fibonacci numbers, all right? And what we could do here is, is use, again, our good old bang bang operator to actually go in and create this. Now, we can certainly do this, make everything good. Oops, let's do this. There we go. Now, if we try and grab the first three of the Fibonacci's, we'll see one, one, two. If we take the first five Fibonacci's, we'll see one, one, two, three, five. Just because, again, it will, the base case is always the empty list. This is why this is going to end up being one.
and the first elements are one. Um, we can use these intermediate results to grab this, but we can also use fibs and 100 to actually get pretty large versions of the the, the Fibonacci sequence, okay? Um, until we, you know, probably blow up the stack. Um, <laughs> so if you actually ask something like crazy, like the first 10,000th number or something like that, you might end up like, you know, potentially uh, killing your Haskell level just because it's to compute that. But um, it's not a, fu uh, a function of the actual, uh, the ability of the thing not to be able to compute it. It's actually the ability of um, the Haskell level to spend time to actually go through and do it. You know? So if you go and type in 5,000, you're going to see something crazy like this. All right. Or if you do, you know, 5,001, you're going to see something nuts like this. Where, you know, just behaves insanely different, right? And you can actually go and check to see these going up. But notice that the actual um, Haskell Rocket was able to compute fairly large numbers um, without having any problems. So that's it. Um, we are done with uh, our review of uh, Chapter 10 on um, folding lists. Um, are there any questions? I'm going to stick around for a few minutes. Um, just a reminder for next week for folks, we're going to begin our discussion on algebraic data types, which in the book uh, that we're covering, the Haskell book from Perth's, Haskell programming from Perth's principles by Julian Ranucci. Um, and um, uh, Christopher Allen. Um, that is chapter 11. Um, in the Learn You a Haskell book, I think algebraic data types come in pretty early on. Um, data types, yeah, it's in chapter 8. Just around the same discussion that we had with um, type classes. So folks who are following both, you can certainly do so. Are there any questions? Okay, well, thank you for joining. Um, we went, you know, kind of a little under time, but um, thank you all uh, for, for, for joining us this week. Um, I'll see you guys next week. Thanks.